So, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hello. Um, I think we are almost full. I, don't, I think about 20 people signed up, so that's ish the amount. Um, welcome to this talk about hacking a smart TV. As you see, we're going to look at two different smart TVs today. I am Raphael Schiel. I'm working with the company One Consult since about three years. I'm doing security research there mostly. And in the last year, I'm heavily focusing on IoT devices to the content. At the beginning, I will talk very quickly about the One Consult, our company, the company I'm working with, and then a short introduction of Internet of Things. I will keep this really short, um, especially because everybody in here probably already knows what Internet of Things means, but also everybody has a different definition of it, and for everyone, Internet of Things is a little bit something else. I want to add the perspective or some key points from a hacker point of view, what is really interesting about it for somebody who's in security. Good. Afterwards, we come to the demonstrations. Um, there, I would like to show you how to hack an IoT device in general, but also, of course, today these two TVs and how to make an exploit most attractive for an attacker. Uh, for this, the general way it works is we will hack one device. For Samsung TVs, this is really easy. That's uh, all already known. Then we develop an exploit. An exploit is a piece of code that allows to execute code on a targeted system by abusing a bug in the software that's already on that system. Um, we will two different exploits for these TVs. And then we will look at ways how we can spread the exploit. Because so far, if somebody hacks a TV, you always needs physical access. We changed that a little bit and trying to spread it over uh, different channels. And at the end, post-exploitation, meaning as much as how can an attacker earn money from the whole thing. These days, attackers are really not in it anymore for uh, being proud of what they do or whatever. They're really trying to earn money as any criminal does. And at the end, uh, also something very important. Why is this important for broadcasters? What can they do? And what are the countermeasures to what we showed today? Very quick introduction about the company I'm working with. Um, we're trying to be product and vendor independent, so meaning we don't sell any products or something like that. We were founded in 2003, but as I said, I'm only working with the company in three, year, th three years. I will actually move to Germany, so we have an office there this summer um, in Munich, and we have another office in Zurich and Bern. I will try to focus the office in Munich heavily on IoT and the normal penetration testing. We have many international and Swiss clients, of course. We are a little bit more than 20. I think we are more towards 30 people right now at the company um, for Swiss standards for a poor penetration testing team. I think this is one of the biggest one, but it's very quickly you're one of the biggest one in Switzerland. Um, we are trying to develop a bunch of zero days every year. We are currently stuck around 40. Uh, it really depends what you call as a zero day. So zero day is a new exploit. Um, if you call every buck you find as a zero day, we are way over 40. If you call only, count only major products, then we are under 40. So what do we do? Our core business is the penetration test, but a lot of people at our company moved a little bit away from it. I think the last penetration test I did is over a year ago. Um, we do a lot of ISO 27001 audits. We have five lead auditors or four or something like that, and IT forensics. I used to work a lot in IT forensics in malware reverse engineering, but now we also have a lot of first responders, so people who, if there is an incident in a company, uh, can be contacted 24-7, come in the company and help you out with to respond to the malware, respond to the malware, and help with the whole case. 
Of course, we do security consulting, security training, or presentations like this here. And we offer manage and support, um, meaning if you need a security officer at your company, uh, you can rent one from us. This is the last sales slide I have. Um, afterwards, it gets more interesting. So this should show a general overview how um, an attacker works or how we assess a system. I just want to go through it very quickly. At number one, you can <clears throat> see the readiness for IoT devices. This is one of the biggest parts. This means setting up cross-compilers, so a, a way to compile code for those devices because that's not always so easy, meaning it gets uh, to know more about the system, about the OS, usually a Linux they use, and so on. Then intelligence gathering. It's what you can find about the company online um, without really touching the target itself, meaning, <laughs> for example, Googling, LinkedIn, what do they write in their descriptions for open position. If they're looking for somewhere, uh, MySQL specialist, we know they use MySQL in the background, and so on. Um, then the entry point analysis, that's probably the biggest part in a penetration test. It's just looking at the system and identifying holes without abusing them. Abusing the holes to get access to the system is then the um, exploitation, so from number three and four, and the post-exploitation, meaning getting evaluated rights on the system and making sure whatever you planned on the system is not removed fastly. So after that, there is the lateral movement. We will look into this today a little bit. It means when you're on one system, how can you get on the other systems? Especially with TVs, this is one of the most interesting points because they have the possibilities for wireless or for Ethernet. So it's very interesting to look around in a company once you hacked one of the TVs and see if you could maybe get into a wireless network or if you could get any further over the Ethernet network that is connected. And at the end, data exfiltration, of course, if you steal data or whatever, there is, it's always important to find a way to bring it out of the company back to the attacker side somehow. So that's also something, especially banks and so on, are very interested on to analyze how can they block this. Because um, only having a virus is often not too bad, but if data gets stolen, everything gets really, really bad. Okay, so now coming to IoT security. Um, IoT really presents for the industries a uh, huge new opportunity. Uh, people talk about next industrial revolution and so on. We all heard of this probably so many times. What we shouldn't forget is all those new opportunities are also very good opportunities for attackers, hackers, or just cyber criminals. And they are really interesting and they make a lot of money right now with it. Very quickly about IoT. Uh, it just generally means for me, everybody understands a little bit something else, that there will be way more devices out there pretty soon. So these are the number forecasted by Juniper Research, 46 billion, or Cisco 3.4 devices and connections per capita by 2020. They don't match up except if the capita grows extremely fast, but generally we see everybody goes will have about twice as many devices in four or five years that are connected to the internet than he has now. And another very interesting trend that comes with that is internet is not only for PCs and servers anymore, but for many different things also. <coughs> like for the end user, people have a smartwatch, people have a smart fridges, especially in Korea, they, those were very trendy for a while, and people have smart TVs. The smart, TV, uh, smart fridges got hacked a while ago. I think it's now over a year ago. Uh, so people went away from that anymore because everybody had a virus on their smart fridge. Um, then they had like smart water boilers. They moved away from that due to the same reason again. 
So those end user devices are already targeted very often and a lot of money is made out of it. But what people often forget is to see the industries. Um, they profit from it hugely, not only in the end user sector. Okay, just a very quick overview what we are looking today. Um, I have no pointer, but on the left side, um, you see all the devices. And the big difference for me here for an attacker is that those devices are all pretty much the same and they connect to one point. So this is usually a cloud controller from General Electric, Huawei, all those big companies offer those systems and all the devices connect to there. So this gives very centralized attacks which very high homogeneity. So meaning all the devices that connect are there are probably exploitable with one piece of code. This is very different to what you have on your laptop because on your laptop everybody uses different browsers, different operating systems, visits different sites, uses different antivirus and these days probably also different anti-exploiting toolkits. Even Microsoft has one per default installed and so on. All these problems we do not have right now with IoT security. So we are like there where probably the laptops were 15 years ago. This makes it very attractive due to exactly this reason, high homogeneity and very many devices. The other thing is um, that I learned with working with IoT, it's really hard to protect these devices. Um, they must be very, very cost efficient. You cannot just give the costs further to the end user because they will just go to the other TV company or whatever. So. The devices must be low cost and this is a problem for security. There is not enough performance for encryption and decryption. There is not enough money for a trusted platform model chip and so on. So these things are very hard for the producer or the factory to know how much security is good but staying competitive at the same time. Also the attacker often has a one-to-one -one copy of what he attacks. That's never the case if you attack a laptop of a specific target. <laughs> if you pick anybody from, from a company that has a higher position, you never know exactly which browser he uses and so on, which makes it way harder to attack him. IoT devices, this is usually not the case. You know very much about the target. And the patch cycles are hugely long if they even patch because it's so expensive to patch IoT devices. Uh, TVs is a little bit different, but imagine not end user devices, they communicate over LTE. They are mostly one big blob of uh, code, meaning the whole system has to be patched at once. And now you have one million devices and you want to send one million half a gigabyte over LTE every week. This is extremely expensive um, and you cannot stay competitive again. So we will do exactly that. We will pick one of those TVs and um, take control over it so that we know what we are working on. Next step, we will develop an exploit. I don't know how the live hacking came into the title. I will not develop a new exploit here, of course, but I will show two developed exploits, two exploits we wrote, and um, spread those exploits to the other TVs and so on. And at the end, a little bit talking about post-exploitation. I assume everybody in here is from IT, so usually it's always a big discussion here. Why even hacking smart TVs? I will talk about this a little bit then, but for everybody in IT, it's usually clear why you cannot just let people control your TV at home and so on. One thing before we begin, um, this is basically what's important about the TV these days. It's really even from the hardware, I think it's very much just a computer next to a TV. So smart TV is just a computer and you have a TV. I even think the DVB, I'm not too sure, but from the way the thing crashed, it looks like the DVB uh, is in a coprocessor, it's not in the same processor handlet or at least very split it off of the rest. So I th this is really two things in one device that can communicate with each other. 
So we have the classic TV or antenna or whatever, but we have the new computer with USB network cameras, wireless, and so on. Even those, so the white one is a very new model, or now it's all, also a year old, but black one is a little bit older, but the one over there, I think, is a C1, even older, so the one used from here. And um, even this one has all those features already, so that's very common for a TV these days. To have smart TVs is probably really attractive because there are a bunch out there, um, 200 million or more uh, TVs right now, and there are very few models actually. So Samsung has a lot of TVs and all different models, but they run the same uh, operating system in the background and the same level of code. There are maximum rather less one model per year from Samsung. Um, TVs are used in companies and at home. That makes it interesting once they have a camera or once you want to attack further targets. If you just want to abuse them for DDoS attacks to other systems, then it doesn't really matter where they're used. And as I said, they have everything a normal computer has. So. Um, one thing that is from the past, and I heard a lot from the broadcasters, is the idea of a TV is it's only a TV, so it doesn't really matter if it's secure, which was correct as long as you used DVB uh, only. But now you have communication in both ways with the internet, so the thing gets to be a, has to be protected like any computer, like anything you use in the internet. Um, one of the best things about attacking TVs is you can persist in there. Uh, not even a factory reset can delete your malware or whatever you put in there. So once you have a TV, I don't think it's really a way, there is really a way uh, to get rid of it except exchanging the flash drive manually, which will not be done because then it's cheaper to actually buy a new TV. And the TVs stay out a long time, I think averagely about six years, um, which is not like with the laptops, maybe three years or something, but the TVs will just stay forever. So the problems we create ourselves today will be there in six years, in 10 years. That's something very unique. And not all of the problems can just be patched away. So about hardware hacking, I said the first thing when you start with an IoT device is getting control over the hardware. For TV, this is really simple. You want to get one device to duplicate your exploit to all the other ones. Um, one thing that, has, that was learned is that when the attacker has the hardware, actually, he usually gets on it. On the picture on the left, you see a company, a very big company. This device is produced multiple million times. Um, forgot to turn off on their device JTAG, which is kind of a debugger interface that gives you direct access to the um, CPU. So you can write directly CPU code, uh, assembly code, and have full control over the system. All we had to do is to solder on a bunch of cables and learn how to talk with the CPU. This is usually used during manufacturing to uh, set down some comments, but usually turned off afterwards. But if it's not easy like that, sometimes you have to unsolder the NAND flash. Um, that's just a flash drive that's on any device. These days you always have this flash, like in a USB stick. Um, you unsolder it, you take it out, you read it manually, you change something that is not signed, and you put it back in, solder it in again, and run it. Now, that when the changed program uh, starts, you have your code in there, and it will create a reverse shell, or so reverse connection, or it will listen to a port for an incoming connection. So with this, it's usually very simply possible to um, get control over a device that you have. 
Of course, like banks and so on, they sometimes make this much, much harder, but that's always only if you don't have to stay competitive in costs. Because to make this harder, you need things like a TPM chip, you need to change the code of the CPU itself, and so on. Then you can make it really hard, but nobody really right now has for IoT devices the money for that. So currently it's very simple also with those TVs to get uh, the first access to one of the TVs. Um, the easiest way here is you can just fake a Samsung update, especially with the little bit older models. That's very simple. The Samsung updates are encrypted, I think, with the model name itself. Hence, you can just decrypt it with the model name, change it, encrypt it again with the model name, and send it as a Samsung update. Uh, this is how Sammy to go, uh, Sammy Go does it. That's the community with Samsung TV hacking. Uh, they helped me a lot with the initial steps, and yeah, they're really onto this: how to get the first uh, connection to one of the TVs. So afterwards, the real problem here was a little bit to get all the debugging tools running, like GDB and so on. GDB is the GNU debugger. You need a debugger to write an exploit. And the cross-compiling, with cross-compiling all the libraries is more the problem and the thing that takes a lot of work. Okay. After that, um, once, Once you have the access, I will, due to the time, not show how to get access to the TV. It's really simple. Uh, we anyway use that access later on. I will explain it then very quickly. Um, after that, the interesting part for us comes, and that's writing an exploit. So when we have a classic TV environment on your left side, uh, you see the one-way communication of TVBC and TVBT, and on the right side, all this new stuff that is added. Um, you have mostly things over the internet, like apps, you have wireless, LAN, and USB. TV so far got hacked with uh, USB and with apps. So you plug in your USB stick, uh, and it abuses, or you install an app from the USB stick that abuses a weakness. Also this and downloading an app manually that hacks the TV is absolutely not usable for, for a, an attack that is really dangerous because nobody just downloads randomly apps in the TV app store and even if it would be easily detected. Um, when you install an app on it, it might be Satu or something you already know. So those things are not very useful for us Somebody wrote about the possibility to exploit the DV TV over DVBC. This was possible a long time ago, where you could send the updates over DVBC, but that's not possible since many, many years ago. And abusing an exploit in the decoder of the DVBC is probably also not possible because, as I said, it's probably done in a coprocessor. So for us, these are the reasons uh, those attacks were not really feasible. Um, we don't want to plug in a USB stick. We don't want to have the user to access, uh, download an app, and so on. We needed a way to hack the TV without user interaction. We will. Uh, we found a way to do that. We'll show you at the end. Um, of course, no physical access. Uh, is possible if you really want to make a dangerous exploit. And we want to be able to target specific TVs and general, like, a wide array of TVs at the same time. It should work against new hardware, like the new Samsung OS and so on. So basically with this in mind, we had two options, attacking the DVB decoder or attacking the browser. I'm more from an environment where I write browser exploits, more, my, uh, more used to that. And the DVD decoder might really be much, much harder than a browser exploit. So we decided to go with the browser exploit. The first exploit we wrote for 
that TV over there, the white one, the small one, was abusing a flash exploit. This is the reason is that it was about one and a half years ago. Uh, flash exploits were very trendy back then. And I don't know if you have heard about the hacking team incident, a lot of flash exploits, a lot of bugs in flash, not the exploits itself, got public, published. So we used one of those and wrote an exploit for it. Um, the general technique back then, I think it worked till somewhere in 2016, was smashing the heap with vectors. Google afterwards worked a little bit on it and it's not that easy anymore, but the general idea of how to exploit a bug like this, um, heap overflow is still the same for many ECMAScript based things like action script in Flash, like JavaScript and so on. So this general idea present here will work for many different uh, exploits you write. The exact buffer overflow has this ID, in case somebody's interested, just Google it. Uh, there is more information about this. The exploit itself to write was pretty simple. It was quite hard to debug it because you're on a TV and that thing crashes all the time for no reason. Um, yeah. So I hope everybody knows at least a little bit about the heap and the stack. Other ways, if I tell something here that is not clear, just interrupt me. Um, all modern browser exploits, or at least about 80%, do work on the heap, so not on the stack anymore. That's because the stack is so easy to protect these days. So there are still a lot of bugs on the stack, but you can't exploit them anymore because it's so easy to find or to protect the stack from this bug, because on the stack you always have very small buffers, on the heap they are much bigger. Okay. So before I show the exploit, I wanna give you a quick overview of what runs in the background. I hope that's interesting for everybody. Um, the first thing one does if he abuses a heap overflow in Flash is he creates a big array, a big vector in action script, and he fills the big vector with smaller vectors. That's that piece of code there. You see how, you, how I create a vector of 1024 elements, and then for each vector, for each element, I create a new vector and put it in there. So the outer blue thing is the big vector, and the small vectors are inside. Just all this lays then on a heap. For those people who want it more correctly, of course, those are just pointers to those other vectors, but that doesn't matter. So from a logical point of view, that big vector has now many, many small vectors in it. Um, now we start to delete some. In the code itself, I delete every sixth. I think here I delete every third of these small vectors we created. Deleting is often done very lazy by um, things like a browser, so a much better approach is just to resize it, because when you resize it, it will not fit into the space anymore, so it has to be freed from there and put somewhere else. But what it leaves us is our big vector has now many, many holes in it, so all the small vectors, are still after each other, but with holes in it, those red ones. Now we create the object that we want to overflow. It's the shader job in this case, doesn't really matter, it's just the object that we can overflow. Because we size those vectors exactly the same size as the shader job we create, it, the memory management of the uh, kernel will use exactly one of these holes. So that's why we have here written shader in one of the red holes now. So shader chop will use this hole. What we know and what this brings us, we know before and after the shader chop, so the object we're gonna overflow is a vector we control, we have access to. As the next step is we overflow, we trigger this bug in the code that uses the heap overflow of the shader chop. So a buffer is one of those elements, and the buffer overflow means a bug that writes outside of those boundaries. 
meaning the shader job now writes into one of the other vectors. We know it's another vector because we place them there. If we do this quite precisely, what's going to happen is we can overwrite exactly the length of one of these vectors. For those who write in C or C++, if you have an array where you can manipulate the length, um, it means it gives you full read and write of the whole process memory. Almost, not all, the, um, not all of it is read and write, but that part you are allowed to read and write, you have afterwards read and write. So you can control the whole process's memory with that, just because you manipulated the length. What I do in this small piece of code is, I have this big OFA vector, the outer blue one, I go through all of those little fields in it and check the length. If the length is abnormally big, then I know it's the one that I manipulated. So I pick it out and name it UFO, so the vector I can use to write the rest of the exploit. Once one has read and write on the whole memory, writing the exploit is really a simple thing. So these are the big steps to go through. I wanna show this on the small TV. try to make it readable. What you see here is just a web server I have access to. Um, I have started a web server, so it's listening on port 80 and 443. And all I'm gonna show now is how to use the flash exploit to overwrite this uh, vector. So, Usually while doing this, there would be a, a TV signal down here. Sadly, we don't have a TV signal, but it doesn't matter too much. In this case, I anyway use the browser. Here we will not use the browser anymore, but the TV signal. So if I start the browser, and reload the page, uh, you see here I have an index HTML. That's the one it will load now. It should load. Sorry, the didn't load the first time. Um, what you see here is I just print out the length of the vector found, right? So this number 107374.1824, you can type it in your calculator uh, from Windows and check it in hex. It's gonna be this 4000000 in hex. So this is basically the proof for IT engineer that the exploit is 100% uh, working. For other people, it might be more interesting to get actually connection to the TV. So what we do next is we will do that. Um, we will use the actual exploit. So I just basically do the same thing. I copy the exploit code towards here. Exploit H stands, by the way, for the H series. That's the series of this TV model. Um, okay.
Now, there will be something happening on both sides at the same time. I hope you can read. Yeah, I think that works. Um, on this screen here, all I do is I wait for an incoming connection from the TV. What I want to show is that only calling the website should already be enough to um, access and make a reverse connection. I often have to reload the <clears throat> so we saw the connection now coming in so the TV has the IP number 17 and we are connected to the TV by exploiting the browser so we see now on we are on the TV um, we are a user called app. Now to make it more persistent, uh, it would be better to have root rights. Um, we are abusing for that. A bug in the kernel. And now we are root. You see always what you are on the last line. Um, this is very simple on a TV. Once you are on the TV, those things are so badly patched, even with the newest OS, that it's really a simple process of getting you from the normal user to be root. Uh, also, even older models don't differ from any user, so you're just root once you're on it. So we now had an exploit and wanted to start to think about how to spread that. Um, the best way and the most easy way to spread an exploit um, is to use HBB TV for us. So somebody mentioned to us that uh, nobody will ever use the TV browser and I totally understand because with this thing, nobody ever gonna surf on the web and on the TV browser. So the way we exploited it here is nice to have and nice to show, but it's not really dangerous because you're never gonna have anybody accessing your site, even though uh, it's still not good. So there the red button or HBB TV helps us out tremendously. Wikipedia just says that it's hybrid uh, between the classic TV and digital TV, um, meaning that we can, for a hacker, it means that we can call any website over a DVB signal. So what this basically does is we have a very insecure signal. We create one afterwards. It's a little bit sad we don't have the Swiss TV here, so we could overwrite it. But everybody can create a signal for like 50, 150 US dollars or something like that and overwrite the TV signal. As long as you're sending stronger, the TV is going to pick your signal. So this DVB signal, especially um, DVB-T, is extremely insecure and it doesn't need to be secure at all. There is no reason to make it secure. But now with HBB TV, we allow to send over this DVB signal, the comment to the TV, hey, go in the background and call this website. So now at once, DVB should be secure, but isn't, and we can abuse browser exploits like this. This is in the design of HBB TV. The idea is that anybody can uh, make such a call. And the call works in the background, so as long as the site doesn't want to show itself, it's completely hidden from the user. 
Uh, when your uh, when the TV has HPB TV turned on, which is should be normal these days or will be normal very soon, due to the voting and so on during the TV shows, um, the user will not see anything of it. It's all working in the background. <laughs> and except of turning off HPB TV, the user can't really do anything. So our new attack plan was, okay, we create a DVB-C signal. We use uh, a HPB TV extension there to force the TV to load a website and send them the exploit we developed over this to the TV. With this, we can target either very specifically one user or we can target a huge area of users by sending a very strong signal. As I said, DVB is one-way communication, which is really cool for hackers because uh, it means you're not traceable back. The time you're traceable back is as long as you're sending. Afterwards, you're just gone. There is no track anything. Okay, as long as you're sending, people can trace you, but you're sending for about one minute to one and a half minute, if, if so, even if so. So there is no way you can trace anybody over DVB back if you're just sending this signal very quickly and then turns its sender off again. Um, of course, there would be more interesting or other interesting ways to get a TV to uh, open a website. One of the most interesting one would be to attack the broadcasters. So of course, if you get to a broadcasting signal, uh, that would be like a honeypot, but that's uh, much more difficult, of course, and depends very much how, on how secure the broadcaster is. But the alternative is the actual red button apps of the broadcasters, if you could attack those. So, for example, SRF has an app that runs, I think, on SRF 1 and 2. And if you could attack those, and if you're able to plant like a cross-site scripting, so uh, a piece of JavaScript code in there that calls in the background on other site, then you will get the same effect and you will be able to take over uh, other TV again. So what I show on the right side is I think I found about 450 uh, of those sites, HPB TV app sites online by Census. Who knows Shodan? Shodan is a search engine where you can give very specific things like the port it runs on and so on. Census is very similar. It's just a little bit better in my opinion. And yeah, it gives you all the HPP TV sites because the, um, the actual HPP TV servers, so the web servers that run HPP TV sites usually identi identify themselves as this. It would be very interesting to look, go through this and try to find a cross-site scripting vulnerability or even more in one of those sites. So I just want to give a very quick demonstration. So usually I want to show here how you can just overwrite any D DVB signal. Uh, you're all broadcasters, so this is really not interesting for you. Um, what I also want to show is the HPB TV extension very quickly. So We just changed the Uh, we just changed the application that is shown because this time we don't want to run the exploit. And yeah, all I have to do is a, a, a UT opencaster stick. I think the only TX, so the only send, the sticks that only send is like $100. Uh, if you want to attack somebody, you might want to use an amplifier that's much smarter. But I think you get around two, $300. You will have a pretty good equipment. So when we run this, uh, we will we'll see the TV signal over there. And 
in the background it loads HPB TV, so the one consult logo is basically just a website, a really simple website on the background. So this is how HPB TV works. I guess most of you are familiar with this. Um, this is the definition or the specification of HT, HPB TV, which is generally very smart to have the possibility to do red button apps and so on, but also very insecure because you can do things like this. So, and basically, when there is another signal, it's just the one who sends stronger. Uh, if you're closer, you're always gonna win. There is no way, like, a broadcaster can send his DVB stream from 115 kilometers away stronger than what you do from 100 meters. There is uh, no way. There is a similar paper about this from the University of Columbia but they kind of missed out on showing what you can do with it, that you can actually exploit the TVs. So basically they sent the paper then to the HPB TV consortium and said, hey guys, it's not secure to call a website over it, but only saying that itself without showing how to actually exploit it actually didn't do the trick for the HPB TV consortium, so they didn't change the standard. And we hope a little bit that uh, one day the standard will change or get more secure. I will show at the end how. So after we did this, we got very disappointed because apparently what we checked is, we had this all in mind from the beginning on, but what we checked is, is it the same browser in HPB TV as in if you start the browser over the app? And it is. But in HPB TV, the flash extension is turned off. So we had to go to back to field zero, very unlucky, and write a different exploit. And actually we came up with a better exploit, a much more fun one, a much more, not more reliable, but uh, a little bit sweeter and a little bit more work from us. The good thing is about these TVs, they're really rarely patched. We informed Samsung about those exploits, but they're not gonna patch it probably. And if maybe in a half a year, and exploits are years old, so um, yeah. There is not really much they do about it, especially with the older TVs, because it's so hard to patch them. It's one big blob of executable, and patching it is a, hor a nightmare. So there is a, a little bit an old vulnerability in arrayprototype.sort, which is really a classic vulnerability in IT security. Um, when you sub sort something in an array, you often want to provide your own compare function. This is the reason because you not always compare one to two, you maybe want to compare a name to another name and you want uh, uppercase A to be sorted the same way as a lowercase A or something like that. So you cannot just take the ASCII numbers and sort it by this. So you can provide a own compare function in JavaScript and this is implemented in WebKit. So the same browser that Apple uses is um, used on this one. So in WebKit, the JS array sort uh, is in array sort.cpp, so a C++ file if you want to check the code there and verify the exploit. If you have such a JS array, it uses a structure to hold the values inside the array. This um, has a length element, uh, number of values in the vector, which is actually the true length, um, as parse value map. This is for lazy in in initialized arrays. I'm not gonna talk about it here and many other fields, but this structure is very important for the exploit. Again, we are trying to manipulate one of the length fields and we will be successful for this with this. When now an array is sorted, uh, he, the C++ code copies out all the elements from the, the storage and puts it into an AVL tree. This is a structure that, which is very good to sort things in. And this AVL tree, so this is a piece of the code uh, from uh, WebKit, this AVL tree actually holds then all the elements. They are sorted in there when they're copied inside the tree, are so, get sorted and then copied back into the storage. There is another function uh, called array prototype.shift. 
shift is removing the first element of the array. So uh, zero array would be element zero. And the cool thing is with shift, the array gets reallocated immediately, meaning it does not anything lazy. It just reallocates, shifts away the array and moves down the whole array header for one position. An array element is in JavaScript always 64 bytes, uh, bits. So what actually should happen is this. The old storage uh, calls for always two um, elements, the sort function, or not the sort function, compare function, over and over again. It gets copied in our AVL tree, one of those binary trees. But doesn't matter too much, it's, it's a common IT structure. And afterwards it's sorted in there and gets copied back. Now the new storage, this is a little bit simplified, it's not 100% correct, but the new storage where it gets copied in, once that is done, the old storage gets freed, meaning deleted. It's not, it's almost correct. Um, so the problem is now, and it's a very common problem, is what happens when the sort function, our custom sort function, actually deletes an element of the old storage? Now, because it immediately shifts down, when you do this on value one and two and you immediately shift down enough, then where before was element three, now is the header of the uh, whole storage. Does that make sense? Okay, good. So if you shift it down, there is the header instead of the element. The actual sort function or the actual copy function doesn't know about this shifting. It doesn't know that the sort function called a shift. And therefore, um, we'll just copy information from the header instead of the elements inside the AVL tree. Now, when this is copied back, now you just copy back information of the header into the new sorted tree. And the new sorted one will be the original size, but some of the values are instead of the correct values, actually values from the header. This way you can read information from the header itself. It's called a memory leak. So this is what we do here. Um, what we are looking for with this leak is, so, Epsilon zero and X one is we created an array that has the first element zero, the second one, third two, uh, the, yeah, first element one, second two, third, uh, no, first zero, second two, third, okay. First zero, <laughs> second one, third two, and so on, makes sense. So just fill the array with a number of one, two, three, four, five, and so on. So this is our custom for sort function, and this little block will only be called the first time the sort function is called, because only exactly then the first element the passed is zero and the second element is one. And exactly then we're gonna shift three times. Uh, we shift three times 64 bits off. What happens is, we shift exactly to the um, point where we can read the actual address of the array itself in the memory from the structure I showed you before. So with this part down there, we are afterwards able to access this array with A1 um, it's now in the field number two, is now this header information. In this header information, we find the address of A1 itself. It keeps a link to itself. That's uh, something it does against the garbage collector. It doesn't really matter, but it keeps a link to itself. And with that, we have afterwards in val value the information on which physical, uh, not physical, but in which address the actual array lies. So what we do afterwards, we use the same buck a second time, but now we already know what A1 has, what the address of A1 is. We create the second array, A2. We 
um, set the length value of the second array to the address we read from the first array. So the length value of the second array is completely absurd now, but it doesn't matter. We shift, two uh, we shift one time, so 64 bit, and those are 32 bits, so both elements here are shifted away, and in, um, when he thinks now, when the, the code thinks now, he reads the length value, uh, he reads the ms parse value map, he actually reads the length value because we shifted it down. So for the second array, he reads now a pointer to the first array instead of its own s parse value map. And as I said, this map gets freed at the end of the whole function. So what happens is um, when the map gets freed, our first array, A1, gets actually freed. So it's gone. But in the code, we still have a pointer to it called A1, and we can use it. This is the creation of a classic uh, use after free exploit. So we can use the memory there, even though it's freed. To exploit such an UAF is, in this case for the TV, super, super simple. We have now the holes in the memory and that is freed, but we have a pointer to it. So we just create a second array, so a third one in this case, um, that will use this hole. Now we have basically two arrays pointing to the same address in memory. Now we can change the, with the first array the values, which will actually change uh, the header structure of the second array because they're pointing to the same area in the memory and the actual code doesn't know that. So in short, what we do is <clears throat> we change the first array so that we get a second array that is hugely big again. So we change the uh, length field of the second array. And afterwards we do the same thing as in the first exploit we are searching through all the newly created arrays. Look where the length value is not correct. And if we found it, then uh, we know we have the manipulated one. So this is the correct length value. If the value is actually not the same, then we know we found the uh, manipulated one. Here we call it address space 32 because we have read write on the whole address space. Yeah, exploiting that is rather really afterwards very simple. The whole exploit was a little bit complicated, but very fun to write. So what I want to show you now is how to do the whole process. So we want to create the HPB TV signal that makes the TV call a website from a web server, a public web server, in this case it's a local one, could be a public one, and from there getting the exploit code running and getting a shell onto the TV, which would basically prove or does prove that we can take over TV on the specific circumstances, of course, that run HPB TV. We use the same signal as before, but of course I have to change uh, the exploit. Because it's not the same exploit as for the white one, we have to change it. So. Okay, so all I did here is just starting the web server.
let's see if uh, smart TV is on. Thanks. I see it's smart to be sold. Looks like it. There is one little thing we have with the exploit. Uh, actually, if you start the TV right away, the DVB is started so much faster than any other process. So things we need to exploit that from the other processes are not started yet. So I usually tend to wait half a minute or something before I run the exploit after starting. Um, now everything should be started. Here we see the server listening for incoming connections. And let's hope it works. So I'm sending the TV signal now. I'm sending on SRF1. Uh, it's the frequency from SRF1 in Talville. We see here how it connected. Uh, first on the top, we see the calls for the, this head is very typical for HPB TV. It always makes just the head first to check if it's there. Then it makes all the get of the exploitation files. Uh, we see here the leaked heap address is the address of A1 and so on, the exploit run, ran correctly. Very lucky. Um, we're gonna open a second window to connect to it. So the, this exploit code just make, makes the TV listen on a certain port. The port is one, two, three, four, five in this case. Uh, we can use any part or use it as before, making a reverse shell where the TV connects to me instead of me to the TV. Doesn't really matter. Yeah, and we are on the TV. So I was able to connect uh, on this part. And here we are directly root on that TV. Meaning sending such a DVB signal uh, allows us, at least for this TV, uh, TV series and probably for many others if you spend time on it, to actually get full control over the TV. The next thing is, something I already did a little bit as a backup in case the exploit doesn't work, um, is to persist yourself on the TV. It's really easy. The TV has certain areas that are read-write and certain areas that are not. The good thing is a factory reset actually only overrides the areas that are not read-write. So anywhere where, anywhere where we write, especially in the folders of the apps, will not get deleted during a factory reset. So we persisted ourselves on this TV. Um, this shell I have here is very, very uncomfortable to work with. That's why we uploaded a default shell from SemiGo that is uh, very much more comfortable, but it doesn't really matter. I can show you this one too. After they exploit, the TV should still work. Yeah, very good. I'm to stop sending that signal, otherwise we're gonna have a problem. And now I actually can connect to the TV over the persisted um, shell So this now is the normal shell, the semi-go, uh, not the one that is sent over the exploit. Um, 
we can connect also with Telnet, which is a little bit more comfortable than Netcat. And we are on the TV, trying to send a different signal now. Interesting. So when we are on this TV, usually I would like to show how to swap TV channels and things like that. Um, doesn't really work here because we have no real TV, TVB signal, so I cannot show you how to swap from SRF1 to something else. Anyway, we are on the TV. Something we can show is, for example, for post-exploitation, um, to run nmap, so to try to attack um, other servers on the, on the same network. One has to set up nmap a little bit. So Basically, I started now Nmap running on the TV. Everybody who does a little bit of IT security knows Nmap. It's the most common port scanner. It's just, just we can really do anything on this one now, and i talk later more about it, what could be dangerous. But here, I just scanned this laptop. Um, it hopefully doesn't find anything. But it's just here to show you from here on, I can try to attack other targets. One of the most common ways turning on wireless LAN. Uh, a lot of people do Bitcoin mining on hacked IoT devices, and most money is made currently with actually using those devices to DDoS other systems, um, especially in Asia, but also here um, in autumn. So, and we finished, didn't find anything, no parts open. Um, in autumn, there were DDoS attacks that even took PayPal down, the Akami network, and so on. So those IoT devices are really already used for services that you can buy, such as DDoS attacks. Okay. Yeah, as I said, run and sell DDoS attacks. Um, you have Spotify, Tumblr, GitHub, Reddit, print, uh, Pinterest. I think that's the where you can publish your pictures or something, and Twitter and so on all got down due to a DDoS attack from IoT devices. It's a very common service actually in Asia to harm your competitors to buy DDoS attacks, and those are almost all executed from IoT devices that are hacked. Um, alternatives, yeah, I have to hurry up a little bit, so alternatives, as I said, turn on wireless LAN, hack the internal network, M probably if it has a camera or a microphone, spy on the people that are in the room, spy on the company. If it's in a conference room, this is extremely interesting to just listen to what all the people say in the conference room and to film them. Um, yeah, get access to as many devices as you can, or the best thing is actually having fun with it. We attached our DVB sender to a drone because I cannot fly it. I'm a horrible pilot on the thing, but I wanted to fly once one, so I had to find a reason to buy a drone for company money. 
Um, <laughs> so what we did is we attached the DVB sender, this little stick with a little bit um, of an echo pack that's there and the actual antenna. And we are flying around with it and it works very well. I cannot fly in here. I'm too bad to fly on such small distances. But the whole thing is uh, 300 gram-ish. It's a Phantom 1, so that's just the limit of it. It doesn't fly too well anymore, but with a newer Phantom drone, it would work extremely well, for sure. And it's really fun because you can just fly outside the window and uh, you take over the TVs that are connected inside. It's really fun to look at. Um, yeah, summary of the attack. What did we do? We send it. Yep. We have the... Oh, it doesn't need, doesn't need to stand anymore. Um, we sent the DVB signal from the classic environment, so sad. And over this insecure channel, we need, we're need using something that should be secured. This is the HBB TV request. We send it over DVB-T. The HBB TV request forces the TV to call a website in the background. We use an exploit to get full control over the TV by <clears throat> abusing a little bit an old version of that website and combining this all together I think it's a very potent attack and very well possible that somebody as you, uh, will abuse that very soon. Um, after all it's hard to impossible to remove the backdoor again so I have no clue what people would do if I would walk around with this right now outside and take over all the Samsung TVs I can find, or at least of this model, because it works, um, how they would ever get rid of the backdoor we have in there ever, besides throwing away the TV. And the nice thing is, as I said, those TVs stay six years ever, actually, so I can take my time to write those exploits from now on. Countermeasures. Um, I really don't understand the concept of the HPB TV, uh, how it works. For me, it's really dangerous to use such an untrusted signal to do something really critical. In When we talk about website security, calling a different website would be already classified as a vulnerability and um, called an XSS, cross-site scripting vulnerability. The HPB TV should really make a certificate authority and give to the broadcasters, for example, intermediate certificate authority, and the browser only calls websites that do provide such a certificate, meaning it only works over HTTPS, but that's anyway, should be anyway a must have. Um, this would allow for people like me, we could still create the signal and make the TV call any websites but the TV would actually not lo load the website in the background because we cannot provide the certificate. But it also wouldn't hinder the broadcaster because they are all intermedi intermediate uh, authorities to create as many certificates as they want. So I really don't understand why things like this are not already in the specification. And I would recommend for, or I will recommend, I should recommend to HBB TV to do that to the consortium. And of course, TV manufacturers, but they're on it. They're trying to make the newer series more and more secure. They're really on it. So at least Samsung, I know. Uh, it will take their time. It will take time. And it's always on the big cost pressure. But the actual people who create the TV will never be fast enough to patch the exploit, uh, to patch the bugs in a browser before the exploit is written. Because they need to consider that if they patch something wrong, anybody can throw all the TVs away. So those patches need to be rock solid, while somebody who writes an exploit is happy if it works 50% of the times, right? So that's way faster. Yeah, to broadcasters, as I said before, uh, it's getting really an attractive target to send a DVB signal to many, many people. Today I talked only about DVB-T, uh, you also send it for DVB-C and so on. Probably it would even or might even work over IPTV or it sure works also over IPTV. And so the broadcaster would be also a very attractive target to manipulate the signal there just slightly. And 
uh, as I said, if you have HPB TV already um, activated, it's also very attractive to add an XSS cross-site scripting in there. So I would recommend to have it checked. And overall, just remember, uh, DVB was one-way communication and it is not anymore. So it really need, needs to be secured if it's used like that. For me, before we come to the questions, uh, one big thing. Usually when you work with IoT devices, the one thing that makes IoT devices hard to hack is an attacker does not get into the communication between the IoT device and the backends because it's never calling an attacker side or anything like that. And HBB TV exactly gives that missing puzzle. And that's a risky thing. Don't want to talk ba bad about HBB TV. It has really cool side effects, but it would be great if it's more secured. And if you have any more questions, please ask now or contact the company directly. Okay, thanks, that's from my side.